president of Brandeis University a year ago. I have been a law professor for over 20 years, a law dean for the last six of those years. In all those years, I told my students, as you undoubtedly have been told, that law is excellent training for a whole range of things that you might do, whether it's be a lawyer, or go into business, or run an organization, or politics, or policy. And so I said that for over 20 years. I'm happy to tell you over the past year, as a new president of the university, I've discovered that in fact it is true. That is to say that as I have watched myself take on this position, it is very much the skills of a lawyer that I have used. And I think they're the skills in which I'm quite sure you are all being trained in, in this wonderful institution. Let me, before proceeding, express personal thanks to your, your Vice Chancellor and Dean Raj Kumar, who was a visionary leader. When we first met four years ago, five years ago, he told me of this dream of building a new university on farmland, and they would add one school every year. And I thought to myself, this is a very nice man who has no grasp of reality. Um, but he had a grasp of something more important than reality. He had a grasp of dreams. And I think being able to see those dreams through, and now to look in this room is to see what has actually come of those dreams. To see the, the faculty and the students of this school, and to see what you are able to build in this wonderful institution. So I will, will just add one other introductory note before proceeding to the formal remarks that among the things that could make me feel at home far away from the United States here is one of you who's good enough to be wearing a New York Giants uh, sweatshirt. Uh, and I will just tell you, as a lifelong New Yorker and a lifelong football Giants fan, God bless you. I think that we talk about the internationalization of the American curriculum. We're really not so much talking about a single topic as a constellation of topics, a collection of topics. And what I propose to do in the next few minutes is to sketch out for you some of the things that I think about, that we think about at Brandeis, when we talk about what it means to have a globalized curriculum or an internationalized curriculum. And as I do that, I obviously will make specific references to law and the study of law, in part for my own background, in part for the studies that you are undertaking, but also because I think it's a particularly good example of the issues that we'll be talking about. But when we talk about the internationalization of a curriculum, of a program, we are talking about a number of related topics. We're talking about, obviously, programs for the study of and research in international and global studies. But we're also talking about programs that involve scholars and students from different countries working together collaboratively, whether by exchange or by joint effort. And it also refers to programs that draw upon comparative analysis and the awareness that we are able to understand our own societies with far greater richness and subtlety by viewing them not in isolation, but in comparison with other systems. I will discuss that in particular in a few moments with respect to law. But my point today is that the internationalization of the curriculum or the globalization of the curriculum is more than just the teaching of certain subjects as part of the curriculum. It is really the entire way in which we approach the training of students today which is vastly different, or should be different, from the way in which certainly I was trained, and I will not speak on behalf of your uh, faculty members or even my own colleagues, but I will say I was trained some 35 years ago, where international topics were looked at as an exotic part of the <laughs> curriculum, something apart, something separate. Whereas I believe today we train students to understand that they need a comparative view and they need an understanding of a global world not as something outside of their core preparation, but precisely at the heart of their core preparation.
preparation to prepare them for practice in whatever field in the world in which they will be entering in which globalization is now already a true fact of life. It has always struck me that when I talk to students at Brandeis about who their friends are, who they spend time with, it strikes them as not the least bit surprising that they are students from all over the world. You, your generation, our students at Brandeis, you are citizens of a globalized world, a world in which I consider myself only an immigrant. That is to say, the world has changed over my adult lifetime. But it is a world that you take as a given, and is a world in which you are connected with people literally around the planet. Now, obviously, some universities in the United States have done more in these areas than others. Brandeis University is a relatively young university, having been founded in 1948. I mentioned the year 1948 for our founding. I think I need mention to no one else in this room that it is a, a year that resonates in this country as a time of taking on great challenges, a time of dreaming great dreams, and Brandeis was founded the very same year. But ever since the beginning of our university, internationalization has been an important part of our project. Brandeis has scholarships for international students going back to the 1950s, when it was very unusual in the United States. I will tell you a story that I think illustrates the point. It goes back to a contact from my prior life as, as dean at GW, talking with one of our international Masters of Law alumni from Japan. He had been at GW in 1961-62. And I asked him, your year in Washington, D.C., 1961 to 62, what was the high point of your year? He said the high point of his year was going to the White House and meeting President Kennedy. He said, I can see why that would be the high point of your year. How did you come to go to the White House and meet President Kennedy? He said, well, President and Mrs. Kennedy invited all of the international students in Washington, D.C., all of the international students in Washington, D.C., to come to the White House. I said, how many people were there? He said, oh, there must have been 50 or 60. In all of Washington, D.C., in all of the universities, there were 50 or 60 international students. Today, in our small university outside of Boston, there are over 1,000 international students. So it is an entirely different world But at that time, when it was very unusual, Brandeis already had scholarships for international students. So this goes back to our, our very founding. In addition, our original faculty included many refugees from Europe after the Second World War. So already there was an international feel to this American-based university. So what I would like to do in my remaining time is first to give you some numbers, which is to say to sketch out for you what the scope of an international school looks like today at Brandeis, then to talk a little bit about the internationalization of our curriculum, and then specifically spend some time on the field of constitutional law, which will lead me back inevitably to talking about Brandeis's interest in India and what brings us here now. Currently, As I said, about 20% of our student body are international students. 12% of our undergraduates alone are international students. Students at Brandeis come from 116 different countries, literally every corner of the globe. There are 12 different global institutes and centers, 10 modern foreign languages taught on our campus, eight different area studies programs. There are 250 different study abroad programs in which roughly half of the student body will take place over their four years. So part of their very education is studying in some other country. And perhaps most significant in terms of our outreach, our alumni now live in 141 different countries 
and there are over 3,000 of our alumni living outside the United States all over the world. So when we think about how we have had an impact in terms of those students, we can look where they went, we can also look at what they have studied. As I said at the beginning, it is both about particular subjects, such as international and global studies, dealing with issues of international affairs, but it is also the way different topics are taught. Brandeis, it may surprise you to know, even though we're named for a Supreme Court justice, does not have a law school. But we do have a legal studies program, and law flows through much of what we do. I like to think of us as a school that specializes in law and, law and economics, law and literature, law and society, law and sociology, all the ways in which law is the connecting fabric of a whole host of issues that run through the humanities, straight through the social sciences, and indeed to the hard sciences as well in certain ways. The very way in which many of those topics is taken up requires an internationalization. So that when we talk about issues, for example, of human rights, it is an inherently international context. We are the only undergraduate program to have a program in The Hague, which as you, many of you I'm sure know, is really the, the center point, the headquarters of much of the international human rights law in the world, being the location of, among other bodies, the International Court of Justice. Let me now turn to the area that is closest to my own area of research of constitutional law, and particularly comparative constitutional law, to try to illustrate the point of how we understand our own systems best in distinction to comparison with others. And it is precisely because there are many legal systems in the world that are close to each other that we see the differences in high relief. You know, it's often said that you never really understand the grammar of your first language that you speak until you learn a second language. When you speak, you learn as a child your first language, that's simply the way language is meant to be. You don't think of it as having rules. When you acquire a second language or a third language, that's when you understand not just more about that second or third, you actually understand more about that first. And I think this is true with comparative analysis generally, but let me focus on law. I think we understand more about our own system by seeing it in distinction with systems not that are vastly different, but that are relatively close. So within the area of comparative constitutional law, let's take a moment and think about the issue of judicial review in each of the United States, Great Britain, and India. In the United States, judicial review is thought of as a very robust judicial power. It is the courts that can decide ultimately the meaning of the Constitution. And it is the courts and ultimately the Supreme Court that has the authority to evaluate statutes by the American states and by the United States Congress to determine whether or not they comport with the Constitution, up to and including the right to strike down those laws. So that is in fact a, a strong power, it is a highly robust power of the courts and the judiciary to evaluate the constitutionality of legislation. We can understand that better, I think, and I think American students ultimately learn it best, situating in a continuum. If you, for example, compare it with the kind of constitutional judicial review that the courts in Great Britain have. In the United Kingdom, courts applying core principles of government, including now the European Convention of Human Rights, will determine whether the, a British law is in compliance with those core principles and with international norms and with the European Convention. But here the big difference from what happens in the United States, because it's formerly known as the House of Lords, now the Supreme Court, 
does not have the authority to strike down an act of Parliament, but rather to return the legislation to Parliament, observing that the flawed legislation is not in compliance in view of the court with the European Convention. Now that is in fact a very powerful role because that is a very strong message from the judiciary to Parliament that the law is not in compliance. But it is not the same as striking down a piece of legislation. Does it make a difference? Well, arguably, no, in the long run. Jack Straw, the former Ministry of the Judiciary in the United Kingdom, said that Britain ultimately will have a written constitution. He said it might take 20 years, it might take 30 years, but that ultimately Britain would have a written constitution. In the meantime, there is a difference between what an American court and a British court can do, and it is not just a subtle distinction. Sovereignty in Britain resides in Parliament, and an act of Parliament is the highest expression of the law. All a court can do is to say that's not in compliance with the European Convention, return it to Parliament to fix. Sovereignty in the American system resides not in the Congress, but in those famous opening words of the Constitution, we the people, which is to say, ultimately, it is the Constitution that is the highest authority, not the Congress, and it is the court interpreting the Constitution that is permitted to strike down a piece of legislation, not return it in non-compliance, but strike it down. Now, how does this power that appears greater in the United States compare with the Indian Supreme Court. And here I will acknowledge that I am on the, the, the weakest of my assertions since I'm in a room with people who undoubtedly know more about the Indian Constitution uh, than I do. So I will read your eyes as I speak and see if I'm getting it roughly right. And if not, I'm sure you will take care of me during the uh, question and answer period. The fact that the Indian Supreme Court has the power not only to evaluate legislation, based on the Constitution, but indeed to evaluate the Constitution itself based on core principles and the fundamental law within the Constitution is an extraordinary power, and in fact greater than that which the United States Supreme Court has. If the United States Constitution is amended, then that binds the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court could not strike down a constitutional amendment. It is, in fact, inconceivable, it is a logical inconsistency, because all the court in the United States can do is apply the Constitution. Once it's amended, then that's what it would say. So the Indian Supreme Court actually has an even greater power of judicial review than the United States Supreme Court. And mind you, I don't say this, you've noticed in any of these, to say which is better, which is worse. This is not about better and worse. It's about understanding systems and understanding them in, in comparison with each other. And I think, to a certain extent, you see this greater power or this, this also this role of human rights law in India playing out in another very interesting way. The scholar Dawn Oliver of the University College London Faculty of Law has written about what she calls the horizontal effect of human rights law. The horizontal effect meaning human rights law affecting not only the vertical relationship between the government and citizens, the government and individuals, but the horizontal effect of private people and other private people. In the United States, with the exception of one of the states, there is no such thing as a horizontal effect of human rights law. Human rights law, constitutional law, applies to the relationships between the government and people. It does not apply to individuals. Individuals cannot, by definition, affect each other's constitutional rights. Whereas in India, there is a much more profound sense of this horizontal effect, and part of one's human rights actually affect the way private actors relate to each other. Much more pervasive effect of human rights law. Incidentally, I said there's one state in the United States that does this differently. It happens to be the one that I live in. Brandeis is in Massachusetts, and in the state of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, 
certain constitutional rights actually apply against private actors as well as public actors, including the right to free speech and free expression, which can actually be violated not just by the state, but by private actors. But in that way, Massachusetts is unusual, indeed unique, within the United States. So I think as, as similar as the institutions of free expression, of human rights, of rule of law, of a constitutional structure are in India and in the United States, there are very significant differences that I think tell us a great deal about the two legal systems. And so this finally brings me to the topic of, of our engagement, our interest as a university in collaborative projects here in India. And as Professor Kumar said, this is the reason the program started late, because a discussion of collaborative projects that was designed to last until 3 o'clock took us until almost half past 3. So that's a good thing if there was more to talk about. But let me talk about it again specifically in this, in this context of why in the social sciences, and to a certain extent the humanities, there's a particular draw for us to India. It has become almost a cliche to say that the United States and India are the world's two largest democracies and therefore have that in common. And yet what underpins that cliche, I think, is a deep and profound set of truths. To be sure, India and the United States have significant differences, much of which comes from different contexts, different cultures, different histories. But what we share in common is more than just a common language, although there is that as well. And the very fact that there is a shared language is not to be taken lightly. Politically, at some level of abstraction, there is a shared belief in the rule of law as interpreted and articulated by an independent judiciary. There is a commitment to democracy as the ultimate source of legitimacy in a society. And there is a commitment to free, although regulated, capital markets as the source of an innovative, innovative economy. Philosophically and culturally, we share a commitment to tolerance that is born of multiculturalism and diversity. I do not mean to suggest that these values are observed perfectly or universally. I do mean to suggest that these are values that are enshrined not merely in legal text, but in the shared values of the societies. And it is a commitment to liberty that is born of an acceptance of heterodoxy, not a single inherited orthodoxy. In the United States context, I would refer you to the great judge Learned Hand, some of whose decisions you may even have studied in, courts, in courses, for example, in torts, and if you studied Learned Hand in torts or even contracts, you would not necessarily know some of his soaring rhetoric in the area of liberty and freedom. He wrote a remarkable essay that was actually delivered during the Second World War called The Spirit of Liberty. And he said that the spirit of liberty was based on an acceptance of uncertainty. He said it is a spirit that is not too sure that it is correct. Liberty was ultimately based on a spirit that was not too sure that it was correct. Amartya Sen brilliantly observed that the source of Indian democracy in fact precedes dependence in the mid 20th century and precedes the British experience as well. After all, Britain colonized something more than half of the world's landmass, and yet the experience of its former colonies with democracy and the rule of law is mixed at best. So Indians' democratic roots are better sought in the acceptance, tolerance, and diversity and heterodoxy associated with, among others, the 16th century Emperor Akbar, or for that matter, the Emperor Ashoka of the third century before the Common Era. In this regard, it's interesting to note that in the judgment by which the Indian Supreme Court 
upheld the right of Jehovah's Witness students not to sing the national anthem in morning assembly, the court held that our tradition teaches tolerance, our philosophy preaches tolerance, and our constitution practices tolerance. Let us not dilute it. But I think it is significant that the court did not simply say, this is what the Constitution provides, and therefore we are bound by it, but reaches back beneath the Constitution to its very underpinnings to the tradition and philosophy of this country. We would not expect, we should not expect, the world's two largest democracies to travel identical paths or reach identical results. We should expect, however, that they will have a great deal to teach each other and to learn from each other in the quest to build tolerant and diverse societies based on the rule of law and democratic political institutions and independent judiciaries. If American students in general, American law students in particular, are properly to be educated and trained for a global world in which they will be practicing, and if the scholarship that American academics produce is to be relevant for a global world, that scholars, practitioners, and policymakers alike all now inhabit, our curricula and our research agenda will necessarily continue to embrace the kind of global dimensions that we have been discussing this afternoon. This challenge is hardly unique to the law. In fact, it seems to me that perhaps the best statement of the challenge for students and scholars of the law who fill this hall was articulated not by a lawyer, but rather by the novelist Salman Rushdie, who speaking to fellow fiction writers could well have been speaking to all of us when he said, always try to do too much. Dispense with safety nets. Take a deep breath before talking. Aim for the stars. Keep grinning. Be bloody-minded. Argue with the world. I understand Rushdie to mean by argue with the world that we should challenge conceptions of what is, always asking if this is what should be. Working collaboratively and working comparatively, we are much more likely to avoid the mistake of relying on preconceived ideas in our own legal systems and much more likely to push the bounds of our own thinking. As we aim for the stars, as we try to do too much, we are keenly aware and grateful that we are not in this alone. Together, we will indeed keep grinning and we will be bloody-minded. And together we can continue to argue with the world, that is to say, to challenge ourselves to imagine a world as it should be and therefore as it might yet be. Thank you very much.